Good morning. This is Dimitri Lascaris coming to you from Beirut, Lebanon. I am uh, pleased to be joined today by Hadi Hudayt, uh, a Lebanese journalist who focuses on military and security matters. Uh, My Hadi, pleasure. Thank you, Hadi. Uh, Hadi has uh, been my guide uh, in uh, Beirut and South Lebanon on various of the trips I've taken during the past year uh, and has played an important role in helping me understand uh, the crisis that the country is going through presently. So, Hadi, I wanted to start uh, by talking with you today about something last night that happened that is potentially quite important to the war, and that is that there was a drone attack on a military base by uh, the Islamic resistance, the armed wing of Hezbollah, um, an Israeli military base, which I understand is situated in the south of Haifa. Could you first of all tell us what we know about this attack? What we know until now that uh, the uh, IDF spokesman uh, announced that 67 Israeli soldiers were injured and at least four were killed and others uh, other soldiers are in severe condition right now in the hospitals. Uh, maybe uh, it can reach like 10 others are in uh, severe conditions. Uh, this is a mass casualty event, of course, and um, uh, we should also return to this point, uh, how the Israeli army uh, is affected by mass casualty events, which is one important uh, feature of the war now uh, with Hezbollah. So uh, be before we do that, mm. could you tell us how this attack was actually carried out? What do we know about the means by which? We know that the uh, resistance announced that uh, they launched many uh, missile uh, attacks in the same time that some drones uh, were, were fired uh, at the target. Now, the missile attacks uh, played the role of deception. They uh, deceived the... Uh, uh, radars and the uh, uh, Iron Dome system. It was, the Iron Dome system was uh, thinking that it's a missile strike, a random missile strike, while uh, at the same time, uh, two or more uh, drones infiltrated the uh, airspace of the of occupied Palestine. At least one was from the coastal area and the other one was, was from the, uh, the inside. The Israeli, at least two, I'm saying, because the Israeli army claimed that uh, they were able to down one drone at least in Naharaya, while the other drone was not detected uh, at the same time and could and was able to infiltrate and to reach the target and, uh, in a very precise uh, strike against the cafeteria of a Golani uh, military base south of Haifa. And just tell us a little bit about this Golani. Uh, unit. The Golani Brigade is uh, the el elite brigade in the, uh, in the Israeli army. It's uh, the main, the brigade that played one main, uh, uh, the main roles in Gaza. Mm -hmm. And it's also the brigade that is always uh, based in the north of uh, the occupied Palestine. Mm -hmm. Because of course, they think that this brigade uh, is the one that is going to play the most important role against the Radwan forces right. of the resistance and other forces of the resistance. It's, it's, you can compare it to the, uh, the elite forces of uh, the resistance because they... The, the Radwan. The Radwan, because as I noticed also that uh, uh, from my... my uh, uh, what, what I have seen, and I'm living in this country after all, that uh, the Radwan forces was built to confront the Golani, the, the famous Golani brigade. And even I think that they studied their tactics and did uh, counter tactics and so on. And this is what the Israelis uh, always claim in their studies also. Mm -hmm. Now you say famous, some of us would say, I'm sure you agree, infamous uh, would also no, be because famous, Golani, you know, Golani has been accused of numerous well-documented no, war I'm crimes over the years. Military-wise, yes. the Golani Brigade is one of the uh, la creme de la creme. For the Israeli, for the yeah, Israeli military. That's yes. what I was uh, mentioning. They so, are war criminals, of course. So the, uh, the Times of Israel published a report which said that the drone that did strike was not even detected. So there was no siren. Not only did they fail Two to stories. shoot it down. One that it was detected and the other one that, that it was detected. I was following the news uh, this morning. Right. First they said we didn't detect it. Then they said we detected it, but then we lost 
it's uh, trace. Right, but, but the point I'm trying to make is that there was no siren that warned exactly. these elite soldiers. These they wouldn't have gathered. Soldiers. Right, uh, correct. Uh, right, right. So uh, let's talk about the psychology. You talked about the psychology of this cas mass casualty event and how this is going to affect the, the thinking of both the military leadership and the civilian population in Israel. Look, after the airstrikes against the Lebanon, the thousand airstrikes, at least, uh, or let's say hundreds, at least, more than 2,000 airstrikes and until now against Lebanon. Uh, maybe more than half of them happened in 48 hours uh, time interval. So uh, the first strike against uh, Lebanon was very heavy strike. It uh, targeted uh, the, the whole South Lebanon, the Beqa'a Valley, Dahiye. It, it was a massive strike. It caused about uh, 1,500 uh, casualty in Lebanon, uh, one, civilian, uh, civilian martyrs, 1,500 and more civilian uh, martyrs, uh, and um, we are talking about uh, some 48 hours, 72 hours uh, at maximum, and also about uh, 10,000 injured civilian, that, uh, excluding Hezbollah fighters who uh, were uh, uh, kill, uh, killed in uh, action during the last year, yes. and also Hezbollah fighters who are uh, ma uh, ha having the combats right now in the war zone and uh, are being martyred or injured. And so, what do you think the impact of this particular attack? These airstrikes the yes. caused the uh, Israeli uh, public and, of course, the military spokesman. And we have seen Afikhai Adre how he is speaking lately with overconfidence. This overconfidence, this, uh, uh, you know, self-over-esteem uh, uh, for the... Greeks call it hubris. Yeah. Uh, this seems that uh, such strikes are uh, striking this exact overconfidence with uh, you being able to uh, launch an air campaign against your enemy. Mm -hmm. Now, everyone knows these days in... 2024 that uh, air campaigns doesn't uh, the, uh, air campaigns do, do not solve problems like uh, an armed resistance. Mm -hmm. You can inflict a high amount of damage. Uh, you can uh, destroy cities. You can cause massacres. They did this. We you, you went to Dahiye. You went to Nwayre. You went to to South Lebanon to Haita Shaab to Bikaa Valley uh, during last uh, your last visits. And you have seen how. Uh, these uh, strikes caused uh, massacres and uh, also they destroyed the whole, uh, whole urban areas. Mm -hmm. uh, and they were nothing uh, related to precision strikes like they claim. Of course, they attack targets for the resistance. After all, they have intelligence and they have uh, power. They, they could, uh, they can do it. And they did uh, this in many times. But just imagine if the war was happening without uh, the Israelis uh, causing civilian damage to Lebanon. Right. Just uh, how, how would you uh, see the, uh, the, the whole picture of the war? I would say that Israel is losing. Of course, because after one year and some uh, days, they are still having problems entering some hundred meters in South Lebanon. They are, they are considering entering 300 meters, destroying an empty house and an empty building and planting an Israeli flag for like five minutes and then retreating mm -hmm. is a victory. Is it something that they can uh, show it as yeah. something right. important? We entered, we entered some hundred meters, we planted our flag, look what we are doing. This and they lost in, the first, in their first attempts to invade uh, Lebanon, they lost uh, more than 15 soldiers, at least, if you remember the first days, yes. and more than 100 and some uh, soldiers are in, were injured mm -hmm. by direct clashes with the resistance. Right. We have seen on live TV burning tanks, burning Merkava tanks. We have seen in one of, at least one video for Hezbollah how they were able to detect uh, with thermal uh, uh, vision uh, uh, instruments, they were able to detect uh, uh, a commandos force, an Israeli commandos force that is trying to infiltrate somewhere 
uh, South Lebanon. I, I think it was Blida or Aida. I, I, I forgot actually. Uh, and they were trying to enter and they were ambushed by Hezbollah and uh, uh, many casualties uh, were reported because you know you see uh, you, you can always see the helicopters trying to evacuate the wounded soldiers uh, so you can tell from the number of helicopters how many casualties uh, are among the Israeli army. So uh, w- switching gears I arrived here on Friday and uh, the night before I arrived uh, there were Uh, extremely uh, painful and damaging attacks on Beirut, including uh, the destruction of an entire residential building about, I don't know, 500 meters meters from this hotel. Um, And uh, there was another, I think, apartment building that was struck and was severely damaged. Also, like some hundred meters down there. Right. Uh, The Islamic medical facility in central Beirut was struck, killing uh, seven uh, staff members, including two medics. We visited all of these sites. Um, and it seemed, I think, that Israel had attacked Beirut for, with vicious airstrikes for 11 straight days. Uh, so this was right up until Thursday night. I arrived here on Friday thinking that this was going to continue. But uh, it effectively stopped. And uh, I think you indicated to me there was one strike on an apartment building that wasn't particularly damaging, but was more or less on the outskirts of Beirut during this time. No, there were strikes, but not in Beirut. And they caused massacres, we'll they back. killed people. Yes, we'll come, back to the, we'll come back to those. Mm. But I just want to talk about Beirut. Yeah. So the, as far as I know, during the time I've been here, since Friday, it's now Monday, there was one limited strike. Uh, on you the should extend your staying. Well, this is... <laughs> <laughs> we're going to get into, yes, I don't know if I don't think I'm a lucky charm, but it is something that surprised me. Yeah. And then this report comes out today or yesterday that uh, Biden asked the Israelis uh, to refrain from striking Beirut for a few days. Mm. Uh, what do you make of this? Why was, is, is there some reason, does it have anything to do with Biden, that suddenly uh, on Friday they stopped attacking Beirut viciously? I think that they uh, finished their bank of targets and they needed Biden, Biden to, to say this so they can make it like, we want to strike Beirut, we can strike Beirut. We will again strike Beirut by Biden, the humanitarian Biden, the uh, you know the uh, head of a charity organization. Uh, he told us like, please stop bombing Beirut, yes. and we will try it not to, uh, to stop bombing Beirut this time because Biden, right. who is who is supplying arms for the Israeli army, right. ten uh, for uh, more than uh, at least uh, for now on, it, it, has, it has been going for more than one year, extensive. Uh, supply, supplies for the Israeli army to hit Beirut. They are using the American bombs to hit Beirut. But right. now, now he, he, he claimed this. Uh, this has, uh, first of all, I see that they striked the, the bank of, their bank of targets, their main bank of targets in Beirut, at least. Uh, I know this because, not because of Biden's uh, statement, but because they hit some places that aren't even related to anything uh, related to Hezbollah, they start hitting medical centers and medical uh, war. Uh, do you think that if they knew a place where there is a missile, they would say, no, don't attack the place where uh, sea missiles are, attack the medical center? No, they wouldn't. Do, I, 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 I wouldn't believe it. Mm-hmm. If they knew where there are missiles on Dahi, they would attack missiles first and then continue their uh, regular crimes in attacking right. Right. Uh, medical centers. Mm-hmm. But, uh, but since they started attacking residential buildings and medical centers, I believe that their military bank of target is depleted. Mm-hmm. And that's why they had, they had to stop somewhere. And Biden came uh, like this. There is another thing, important thing. Sometimes the enemy, in, in wars, this happens. Sometimes two uh, are fighting, two sides are fighting, and the one who is attacking the other stops attacking for two reasons. First, to play on this psychology of there is war, there is no war. We are being attacked, you're not being attacked. So we don't get used for being attacked or you don't get used of there is nothing. You play on this duality to play on the psychology of your enemy, that's first. The second thing is uh, sometimes you stop attacking so because uh, you lost uh, monitoring your enemy. You lost. Uh, you, so, for example, you had targets, you had pagers, you had talkie walkies, you had some uh, 
intelligence uh, capabilities and some devices that are booby trapped or mm. are uh, uh, and they used these devices so maybe maybe now they lost the ability of course because hezbollah have uh, should have uh, now moved to another scale of uh, like uh, uh, intelligence uh, precautions you know now i i guess if i if i have seen a hezbollah combatant with uh, a smartwatch, I would tell that he's uh, an idiot. Yes. Because yeah. after what happens, uh, they should get rid of uh, of anything, of anything digital, right. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, it, might, it might be that the Israelis have lost uh, the ability to assess the kind of damage that they did to Hezbollah. So they need to stop a bit from what they are doing. So they let Hezbollah assess what's happening. Maybe this if they had uh, some uh, more spying uh, spies or intelligence capabilities, they could use the assessment done by Hezbollah to assess uh, the, uh, the result of their campaigns and their war again until now. Why? Because I, I have been surprised that until now they haven't presented any percentage. And this is very important. And this is huge in, in wars. When you do not provide percentage about what's happening, about uh, when you don't say that, for example, I destroyed 60% of my enemy's power capabilities, uh, sea power capabilities, 50% uh, of its uh, oil reserve, 10% uh, of its commanders. When you don't use percentage, you're just... Uh, uh, buying uh, applause from uh, uh, the public, but mm -hmm. in military sense, this is nonsense. For example, if I told you now that I have uh, I have destroyed uh, three of your cars, and you have a hundred car, what does it mean? It means that you lost three uh, percent mm -hmm. of uh, of your cars. It, this this won't affect the, the ability, uh, your your uh, ability or your your uh, readiness to uh, go somewhere. Right. It right. won't affect it at all. And this is what's happening right now. They don't know if after this air campaign they launched against Hezbollah, did they destroy 50% of his mis of its missiles, 10% of its missiles, 80% of its missiles? Mm -hmm. Because it seems like they are still able to launch. Uh, uh, the, number, the numbers of missiles being reported by Israel suggest that the launches are increasing. Okay. Increasing, yeah. and also they are selective. They are launching uh, strikes uh, against, and, and missile strikes against the gatherings of the uh, Israeli army. They are still, yeah, Hezbollah has still... Now, now we as a public, we don't have the, the nerves of the people who know what, what Hezbollah has and what the resistance has. Mm -hmm. So they think that we think as a public here uh, in Lebanon that Hezbollah must launch some kind of, uh, you know, a uh, it's an Armageddon if, if they still had any capabilities. Mm -hmm. But the people, the, what I, I have been seeing lately uh, in the last days, they are playing uh, cool uh, yeah. I, I want to come back to that. They in are moment. selecting their yes. targets. They are uh, being able to detect the Israelis where they are gathering, and that's huge. Right. They are able to connect the people who are detecting with the people who are launching missiles. This means that an operation room is still there. And, and it's a fast thing, you know, when you detect, you need to immediately tell the operation room immediately to launch an airstrike to a selected location. This is right. huge. Right. So uh, in terms of intelligence gathering, and I want to just point out uh, what we experienced in Dahia uh, yesterday when we went there, uh, wasn't just yesterday, but particularly yesterday when we, uh, I understand we had pre-authorization from the media department in the we area. Tried, yeah. Yeah. And we, we, we ban, began approaching sites that had been attacked. We saw a number of sites that had been yeah. attacked. Yes. Uh, the streets of this area, which is densely populated, the population in normal times is hundreds of thousands of people in Dahia. Uh, is it over a million, perhaps? It's certainly hundreds of thousands. 800,000, I think, the right. number of uh, population okay. in normal days. And there was virtually 
No, nobody. In broad daylight, we were there, I think, in the middle of the afternoon. Except there were people, who, men, military age men, who looked like they were part of uh, Hezbollah's security uh, or they were operating in some security capacity. Um, and uh, at one point, we saw a building which had been demolished. It was still burning. Uh, and you uh, understandably sought permission from these one of these security officials uh, to film. And they ended up holding us for, they were very polite. Uh, they were they polite, yes. Her, but we had ended up holding us for an hour. Uh, they, they, separated, they were more polite with you than me. <laughs> yes, actually, they separated you from me and Leith. And at one point, uh, as they were questioning me and Leith politely, you... Uh, yeah. approached us and they were very unhappy about the fact that you approached us and told you to go away. But then so that event, happens. Yes, I imagine that also... We have seen police brutality in the West. Uh, it's, it's still better than uh, what's happening in the West. <laughs> right, here in Lebanon, yes. Yeah. So, uh, but my point is, you know, you talk about the fact that the devices, the computer devices now, Hezbollah learned a very painful lesson. But also there's the fact that there's an extremely high level of scrutiny of people in the streets who are uh, taking photographs or behaving in ways that are unusual and perhaps gathering intelligence. And there was an incident recently involving a couple of spies. Just, could you just tell us briefly about that because we're a little bit short on time and there is one other question I want to ask you. Tell they, us they, about they, this did, they uh, discovered an Israeli spy in Bahia. Who was, was it one or more than one? At least one, I, I know. Right, okay. I, I know that there was a different incident, but I didn't check, I, didn't, uh, right. I don't have, uh, I'm not sure about it. But at least one spy, an Israeli spy, was taking photos in a very uh, central place in Dahi, and he was uh, detained. They interrogated him. They sent, uh, and after the interrogation, they sent it to the Lebanese authorities. You mean the Lebanese army? or The, the Lebanese, Lebanese army. Yes. And what uh, happened to him? The Lebanese, I guess the Lebanese army received a phone call from the U.S. Embassy, and they decided to show the act of kindness during the war to release an Israeli spy. Immediate. Remarkable. Not, not, we're very kind people sometimes, you know? <laughs> not we can be very kind in the mind. Not consistent yeah, with what I, we've been told. I'm kind, right? Yes, we're of course, right. absolutely, yeah, absolutely. This is how we all, we all yes. are, you know? Yeah. We release spies imagine, immediately. You can imagine if a Hezbollah spy was caught taking photographs yeah. <laughs> in <laughs> Israel. I don't think they would release him. But in any event, um, the last thing I want to ask you about People aren't happy with it. <laughs> Lebanese I, people. I, I, I wouldn't be happy either they, if I were a Lebanese uh, citizen. No, like how, would, how, how would you uh, detain an Israeli, an Israeli spy? And he's not like he likes Israel. He's with Israel, pro Israel. No, yeah. he's an Israeli spy inside Dahi. Yes. How could which you release is gathering information which is being used to kill people. He, well, he had a camera and he was taking photos. Right, <laughs> right, exactly. So the last thing I want to ask you in the li little time remaining to us, uh, we were talking. You were talking about the resistance's capabilities. Yeah. Um, what do we know about the missiles, the types of missiles that they haven't employed yet? Uh, because my understanding is that uh, their most sophisticated and destructive weapons uh, have yet to be employed in this particular war. Is that correct? And and if so, what can you tell us about these weapons that they've not yet used? So based on what we are seeing until now on the borders and uh, regarding the, uh, how the war is going, we can see that uh, the resistance is also being very selective in re uh, revealing its missile power capabilities. You, we should know, you should note that during uh, 10 or 11 months of the clashes, uh, Hezbollah never used its long range missile capabilities, never. The Katyusha missiles in Hezbollah are considering rocket artillery. So just uh, for the benefit of our yeah. audience, what do you call long range? What do you mean by that? We mean more than the 40 kilometers or 50 kilometers. Okay. Okay. Because Katyusha can range, uh, can, uh, Katyusha, or uh, we call it Katyusha, now the correct term is Grad. Right. The Grad, 120 millimeters uh, uh, caliber. Okay, uh, so to just, for a sense, just for a sense of proportion for our audience, yeah. so they understand what yeah, yeah. this means in this particular area. Mm -hmm. uh, how far, the furthest potential target, I, I believe, from Lebanon would be Elat on Elat. the Red Sea. And the resistance oh, has missiles with that range, certainly. They claim that they have missiles that can reach Elat from northern Lebanon. So it's more right. than 300 or kilometers. From northern Lebanon. And I believe right. that this is very logical, you know, when you want to launch a strategic attack against Israel, you don't, don't launch it from the place where they can target your 
uh, strategic right. missile power with artillery or with houses. Right. You launch it from a very uh, uh, far away location. I, I believe. I believe in some in some moment if if the war escalated, Hezbollah might use Syrian uh, geography to launch uh, attacks, and this would be a disaster for the Israelis because Syria they can't control the. The geography, it's not, it's not like Gaza, it's not, a, uh, uh, it's not a plate on an Israeli table, you know, like Gaza. This is what Gaza is, you know, it's surrounded and, right. it's a, and they are still having, they are still receiving uh, missile uh, attacks from Gaza to Tel Aviv. Maybe some two weeks ago, they right. launched in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the first anniversary of the October 7th, right? right. The right. Hamas launched, uh, Al-Qassam launched uh, missile strikes. Missile attacks, maybe five rock, uh, missiles against Tel Aviv. One right. of them, or two of them, at least landed there. Right. So, what what do we know about the missiles they have not yet used? You know, I don't know any uh, specific I mean, information. Based, based on but let let's let let me tell you something. We know many things. We know first that the uh, the strategic power missile power of Hezbollah is related to the Iranian arsenal. That's first. The Iranian technology, the Iranian arsenal and uh, Hezbollah's uh, missile capabilities uh, are, uh, we can compare, we can uh, think based on what the Iranians are revealing. So we know that the, uh, Iran has a vast collection of uh, different uh, missile uh, technology. Uh, I think that until now Hezbollah never used cruise missiles. Now, what's the difference between a cruise missile and a drone, for example, like, like it was used yesterday? You could ask this. Well, because speed. Speed is a must be. Well, not only speed. Not only speed. Destructive power. They have much more explosive power. So, for example, uh, one uh, specific cruise missile, and we have seen this a replica of this missile. I believe it's a replica, and maybe it's, no, it's Iranian in Yemen, but... Uh, uh, they claimed, the, Iranian, the Yemenis claimed that it's, a re, uh, it's uh, Yemeni. And by looking at it, it's a replica for, uh, of a cruise uh, missile, uh, an Iranian cruise missile. Mm -hmm. This was also seen in a different replica in, uh, uh, or a different version of it in Iraq also. Iraq is firing cruise missiles against Israel if you... Uh, if, right, uh, striking a number of targets. Of course. So, yeah. so the cruise missiles are different from... Uh, Drones, they can, they, they have a, a bit higher speed, speed-wise, and they can carry up to five to ten times more ammunition. So if the drone that struck the cafeteria in uh, Haifa yesterday carried 20 or 30 kilograms at most of explosives with a lot of shrapnels and fragmentation uh, uh, design, and this explains the huge amount of uh, uh, injury and injured Israeli soldiers, you know, because they, it, it had fragmentation uh, uh, technology. It, it, uh, it, uh, the warhead spreads maybe hundreds of shrapnels everywhere, and this is why they were all. And I think it was also airburst, because I didn't see any uh, crater, any impact on the ground. So it must have exploded in the air and causing this. Uh, uh, you know, this uh, shrapnel to go uh, and to hit all the soldiers. And also the, we have uh, lots of uh, uh, strong uh, injuries because, you know, you, when you're receiving shrapnels from the upside, it's going to be your chest and head uh, that uh, are going to be damaged. Right. So uh, yeah, people are going to be wearing helmets in the cafeteria. <laughs> Oh, that's one. That's one. Also, one important uh, right. uh, notice. Like they strike cafeteria during dinner. They were very precise. Right. This, this shows real-time intelligence, and this shows also the abilities of like knowing there is a military base in southern Haifa, knowing there is a cafeteria, and also knowing the uh, habits of the soldiers. Like they take. They, they don't go to dinner at 11 p.m. They go to dinner at 6 or 7 p.m. For example. Right. This needs intelligence. Right, right. This is very important. Right. You also cannot uh, think that Hezbollah is using old uh, uh, intelligence before the war. This must be renewed. 
And we because... know that Hezbollah successfully penetrated Israeli airspace with surveillance drones and has produced the videos to prove it. Yeah. So uh, all of the and targets that they they revealed in those, all of the potential targets they revealed in those surveillance drones, now, now they know that now they can be struck. they uh, proved that they can strike them in precise. You know, they strike the cafeteria. They didn't strike the other place. Because, uh, you know, in, in, war, in wars, you change your habits. And the Israelis, of course, uh, should be changing their habits in mm -hmm. wars, you know. Uh, so, uh, and I wonder why they are still eating in cafeteria. Mm -hmm. And I think that they are doing this be only because they were overconfident that we destroy Hezbollah capabilities, the size right. strike. Right. Because you won't be gathering 100 soldiers to eat in a cafeteria if you were thinking. If you had 1% possibility that Hezbollah might strike the cafeteria because it would be a massacre. For example, unless you're insanely incompetent, <laughs> that, there's also that possibility, which is that just incredible. As, as a military um, uh, analyst, I, I don't think that this is uh, the, uh, you know, the, uh, the Israeli army uh, should, should, should be working uh, fine mm -hmm. and should be thinking that I can, I must not gather a hundred uh, soldiers without helmets and vests in a cafeteria during wartime. Within range of the enemy. Within right? range of the enemy, of precise yes. strikes. Yes. So uh, that's a failure. Yes. And uh, if you want to gather them in war, you, why don't you gather them in the uh, sports uh, hall, for example, or in somewhere else? Why, like our friend said, why didn't you give them sandwiches? <laughs> Ali Murtada. Yeah. Yes, but we, yes. we go. <laughs> go eat your sandwich in the corner by yourself. And so, anyway, we, 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 do need, we, need, we do need to move on. So I just, I don't want to cut no, you no, off. I know, but uh, we're saying that cruise missiles can carry up to 150 to 200 kilograms of, uh, of uh, explosives. This means that the amount of damage, the type of targets that you can target with a cruise missile are different than a drone. A drone right. might open a small... Uh, now, of course, there are stronger drones. For example, Shahid drones carry 50 kilograms. 50 kilograms can destroy all this building, for example, if it attacks. But 150 kilograms and 200 kilograms can cause uh, a huge amount of damage. Right, right. To and the other consideration um, before we go is that uh, whereas the Iraqi militias are firing these cruise missiles from a long distance, as are the Yemenis, which gives the Israelis more time to respond, uh, exactly. these would be coming from a much shorter distance. In Lebanon, it will reach the destination in minutes, not right. in uh, like uh, hours or... Yes. So minutes are a lot, uh, gives the Israelis a lot more, uh, a lot less, uh, much less chance to be able to tell the, the aircrafts to go and find the uh, uh, cruise missile or the drone and down it. You know, this is right. what they are doing. Right. They have to respond with uh, Iron Dome and other uh, David slings and uh, Barak uh, missiles and uh, uh, and uh, hates maybe. I don't think these are not made to face drones, but they are made to face ballistic missiles. Because, and it's the same thing for ballistic missiles. If you launch a ballistic missile from Lebanon, it's not like Iran. It doesn't need uh, half an hour or two hours, depends, depending on, the, on uh, how much uh, the speed of the missile. And from Lebanon, it needs minute, one, two, three, four minutes at maximum right. to reach its target. Right. This is very short uh, time interval for the response. Uh, and also, not only for the response, if you choose to target places that aren't evacuated, would they have the time to evacuate it immediately? What if this cafeteria was struck, not with a drone, but with a 500 kilograms warhead, a precise missile, like uh, the one they, the Israelis claimed that Hezbollah have a lot of it, Fatah 110, which is an, a precise Iranian missile that can carry up to 200 to 300 kilograms of uh, Explosives. Wow. This would have be have been uh, some like uh, uh, not only a mass casualty event. It's a massacre to the right. Israeli army. Right. And this, I think, I, I I think that the resistance here is still giving an opportunity for the world to stop. Mm -hmm. They are saying that we can do it because they released the videos, the uh, surveillance videos. They could have not released it. Right. They were threatening the Israel like. Think again about going to a full uh, uh, war with Lebanon. Why? Because it's correct that you can destroy more of the Lebanese uh, infrastructure and territory, but the amount 
of damage that will be inflicted on Israel will be uh, something that they haven't imagined and they haven't experienced at, at right, least right. until now. Well, sorry to have to end our conversation. Yep. Uh, I need to get to the airport to take my plane back to Athens. It's I been a great pleasure talking to you. That you have a safe flight to Athens. And if we, uh, you know... Uh, please, please, young brother, stay safe in the days and months. We'll try to stay safe. You, you, I didn't mention this because we're in a bit of a rush, but uh, uh, Hadi doesn't uh, attach much importance to his life when it comes to reporting on the war. He puts uh, reporting ahead of his own safety, although he's very cautious. It's very conscious of the risk. Nonetheless, uh, you do a job that's very dangerous. We believe uh, that. So, so we, we believe that uh, we, as the public here, uh, that we believe in the importance of the resistance to all Lebanon, not only to a specific sect or a specific part of Lebanon, not only to South Lebanon. We believe that, uh, uh, despite the fact that you would uh, uh, be. So we are still alive or no after the end of this war, but uh, there is no way that the resistance is going to be uh, defeated and uh, there is no way that we are going to surrender. And uh, for this, we are ready also to uh, do what we must do to uh, support the resistance as uh, journalists. We should report on the war crimes that Israel is, going, is doing and we should also try to uh, give a, a an accurate analysis of what's happening, not uh, because, you know, people who live in Europe, in the West, in, I don't know where, in, U in the US, in Canada, they can't really understand, even if they were specialized in military uh, analysis, uh, how the resistance acts here in Lebanon, based on what they read in uh, uh, Western-sponsored studies. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's different, and, you should, and the analysis is different. So the electors Electricity just went out, so that's a sign we have to go. <laughs> Thank you very much, Abby. Thank you, sir. It was a pleasure. It was a pleasure for you. Bye-bye.